my lyrics just came from a lot of stuff that happened when I was a kid or just, you know, growing up in poverty and not having a lot and just different things. Like my parents died when I was really young. Things like that, I guess, just kind of, it can be a miserable place sometimes, you know? So I think that kind of crept into like the lyrics and the imagery in a very abstract, cryptic way. When you look at the lyric sheets, you won't know what's going on. <laughs> and I like it like that, you know? I like it kind of cryptic and confusing. And we have a song on Dope Sick called Masters of Legalized Confusion, and that's just kind of like my motto, you know? First of all is his words, his, 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 his lyrics, or what do you want to call it, his writings, have been genius since I was fucking writing bullshit metal songs about kicking ass on stage and stuff. He was writing about barbed wire and fucking goddamn methamphetamines and stuff. I'll, I'll use one of his fake quotes. He has a, he always had a fucking box cutter in his mouth. And also one of his his, his lines, he has, his, he has a curdled milk replica of a voice, something like that. <laughs> Those are his words, man, <laughs> at a young age. And he ain't deviant, he hadn't swerved yet. Still pretty curdled. I think it comes from the environment, you know, like the, in the summertime, it's real oppressive heat and humidity. It's one thing, everybody moves real slow down here, you know? This is a real right-wing state. Louisiana is a real, you know, Republican state, but New Orleans is not. It's like a whole different thing to, uh, to itself, you know? We don't even say we're part of the USA. We say we're from New Orleans, you know? It's a European city, basically. The Catholic thing is just, it's overwhelming. I mean, Ash Wednesday is like a huge thing here, which is the day after Mardi Gras. If you put your, your, your excesses behind, right. supposedly. I don't get religion in general, though. I never was raised. I mean, I, the, we were part of, my family had this supposedly, I don't know what, Nazarene religion. We went to a Nazarene church, which I don't even know what that is. And it was just, you know, we'd, we'd leave there and my dad would go home and get wasted and throw the family around and break stuff, you know, watch NASCAR. From the day we began in 1988, you know, which is a long time ago now, we just wanted to play just as heavy as possible, a lot of feedback. People started taking it more seriously we had a couple reviews like in Maxim Rock and Roll and a couple like other fanzines, you know, and they like kind of gave us praise for being this type of band, you know, and, and we were all just kind of shocked, like, wow, this is really could go somewhere sure. or do something, you know. How do you guys think that your sound spread to uh, the other people that you were playing with? Well, everybody's an influence to me because we're all friends here. It's just because we all love music so much that, you know, you're sitting around just like, what do you want to do? Oh, let's start a band. You know, just, and then there's another band that forms and they might not last that long or might not get very far, but you know, it's just something that we all feel like we just, that's what we like to do, you know? And I remember when I was a, a little punk rock kid running around saying, I'd like to see a band that sounds like Black Sabbath, but is a punk band, you know? Like, I had these weird ideas and everybody's like, that can't happen, there's no way that could ever happen, you know, but. Sludge, what is it? You know, what is sludge? What differentiates bands that play sabbed out shit to sludge, what is that? Yeah. You know, and if, if you're gonna call out who you got fucking sludge, then put the fucking crown on their fucking head and move on. Call them the fucking kings of it and fucking everybody else is beneath it. We just wanted to play in a band that we wanted to hear, basically. 
Yeah. You know, we wanted to just make sounds that we wanted to hear. We didn't really care about anybody else. Or we would open for like these speed metal bands or, you know, Exhorter and different out of town bands or whatever. And people would get so angry because we weren't just, you know, fast, you know. Jimmy Bauer's got a lot to do with, you know, why? Because he was in different bands. You know, he was in early versions of Crowbar mm -hmm. when they were called the Slugs. And um, before that, they were called uh, Shell Shock and right. then Aftershock and a whole series of things. A lot of the ideas behind the artwork and, and song titles and everything. We were on a lot of acid and it was just ba totally bad sense of humor. You know, and fucking see how far we can push shit just for the fuck of it, you know? To see it eventually turn into something that we could have fun and learn things and tour was mind blowing to us, you know? Yeah. It really was, you know? And it's still to this day. In September 2000, I Hate God released their fourth LP, Confederacy of Ruined Lives. In the years that would follow, the New Orleans natives would face their largest challenge with Hurricane Katrina, which ended with a band scattered across the United States. It would be almost 14 years until they released their follow-up. I mean, there's there's some lyrics that were kind of written about what I went through, you know? Like, New Orleans is a new Vietnam that was kind of based on, like, not so much New Orleans now, but the way it was then, because it was pretty much chaos, you know? I mean, it was traumatic. I think I have post-traumatic stress disorder from that storm. Sure. Because I was here in New Orleans during the storm, you know, until I got arrested, but everybody knows that story. After being arrested for possession of controlled substances, Mike Williams served 90 days in jail before being bailed out by none other than Phil Anselmo. Williams used the time in lockup to his advantage, kicking his well-documented heroin habit in the process. That's part of the reason we didn't do an album for so long. Like Katrina, you know, separated people. Sure. Like Joey was in Detroit and I was in jail. <laughs> and other people are here and there, you know, so things get mixed up, but uh, that changed everybody's lives. I mean, New Orleans, as you can see, it's like a family, you know? After that hurricane, it just brought everybody even closer together, you know? After a successful European tour in the summer of 2013, I Hate God drummer Joey Lacaz passed away suddenly due to complications from long-term asthma. He was 42 years old. Came home from a fucking five-week killer tour in Europe, you know, to you know, just starting to feel comfortable at home, and get a phone call that, you know, Joey's in ICU, he's not responding. That was definitely a big hit for me and in my life. He was more than just important to the band. His character, you know, he, he was a walking I hate God. Dude had his own groove, bro, his own groove going on. That's the kind of dude he was, you know, he just, he had fucking, he had a giant ring around him, you know? Yeah. Very unique, hilarious, absolutely uh, sought after as a, as a person of fun, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. He just, just he, was a, he was a joy. He was a great man, and, and it's just gonna be missed, man. Yeah. It's not, not gonna be pretty, but because I know about losing band members, obviously. Every, any fucking year that goes by, it gets easier. So, anyway, New Orleans. Love Dr. John, love New Orleans, love voodoo, love mysterious shit. But I think that had a, a really important part in the graphics of I Hate God and to a point to where now it's, you know, Joey was our mentor, you know. It's funny, you think you're teaching somebody something, but they're teaching you, you know? It's the truth. Those are usually the strongest lessons. Yeah. yeah. Despite the tragic loss of Lacaz, 
I had God decided to soldier on, snagging Aaron Hill to fill his considerable shoes. Joey's final contributions to the band can be heard on their self-titled LP, released in 2014. I mean, knowing Joey, the dude he was, his sense of fucking humor, you know, I, I think that's why we just, we kept going, you know, like, you know, let's get a new drummer, let's roll, because that's what he would have done, you know. We're just survivors, you know? I mean, that's all we know how to do. Yeah. Is like, is survive. I mean, it was never a question of ending the band when Joey passed away, you know? We never thought like, oh, that's it, you know, it's over. We used to say that, though, me and Jimmy and Joey would sit around and be like, you know, if one of us dies, that's it. So, but it just didn't feel right. We knew Joey was just like, y'all better not fucking quit, you know? We could just feel that vibe, you know? The city's a fucked up mess, so, <laughs> you know? So are we. Wow, I put two and two together, of course. It's, it's an obvious thing, you know? Yep. Yeah. We just have to push forth, you know? That's all, uh, that's all I've ever known, you know? From being a kid, you know? Yeah. I mean, I've been homeless, you know, I've been in jail, parents, you know, this and that, and whatever happens, you know, you just, it's, you can't give up. I mean, what are you gonna do, give up? You know, it's never, it's never in my mind to do that, you know? Yeah. 